Today we are taking a look at collectible card game tropes from tvtropes.com. In this video we're going to look through the consistencies of card game design to see what we're doing right and what maybe we should change when designing your own homemade TCG. Okay, so we've got game design tropes and card design tropes. And what's really catching my eye right now is card cycling. So in many card games, especially trading card games, aka collectible card games, players have the option of replacing the cards in their hand by drawing extra cards from a randomized deck. These mechanics may appear in the rules for the game itself or show up as a part of another card's effect. Drawing new cards is always a powerful option, as it is one of the most important resources in the card games, sometimes called card or draw advantage. If cards whose presence is negative, such as deck cloggers, I've never heard a call that before, that's quite good, or a card type that exists in the game, then cycling them from the hand with would usually be both possible and a good thing. Yeah, of course. I just want to say the first time I heard the term card cycling was Magic the Gathering, They're using cycle cards, where normally it would be the case of you draw a card, when you play the card, the card's added effect would be to draw an additional card. This meant that essentially it was a free draw to have that card, even though it cost you at the time to actually draw it using your turn, being able to play the card meant that you got a free card. This is a good way of speeding up gameplay in your TCG, just by adding additional draw power subtly, where your, your players don't feel like they're getting a crazy amount of cards, but they're, they're keeping like a constant stream, which means that the players are still engaged because they've got that chance, that extra opportunity to draw something that might win them the game. So there are a few ways to add card cycling to your game. Of course, you can play a card and have it trigger an additional draw. You may have an ability where you can discard a card to draw a card, therefore getting rid of cards from your hand to your out of play pile. You could even do a card that you can reshuffle back into your deck and then shuffle a new card. You can do a card that I would call a searcher card where you play the card and then you can look through your deck to draw something specific. That is an incredibly powerful thing to do in a game. It does heavily speed up games, but I would definitely prefer to do the, the more subtle cycling, we'll call it. But if you are looking to add card cycling to your game, there is just a few options options just to get you started okay let's just pick another one we're going to go with the game design tropes list this time and i'm going to pick power creep actually because i have something to say on power creep so power creep is the process in multiplayer games collectible card games tabletop games video games etc in which newly added content such as character abilities or equipment can be played alongside old content but the new content is far more powerful slash useful. The process makes old content no longer worth using, save for a few exceptions and for cherry tapping. Cherry tapping? So cherry tapping is using something deliberately weak, but using your skill to make yourself look better. It's to humiliate your opponent. I never heard that term before. This makes sense at least from a financial point of view. You want people to buy and use new additions, but why would they do that if they can keep on using the awesome Infinity Plus One sword that they already have? In order to spur sales, you need to have your expansion pack introduce the Infinity Plus Two sword, <laughs> which is overall better. And then an Infinity Plus Three sword the next time around and so on. The level of power present in the game just keeps creeping upward, power creep. This gets out of hand really easy, particularly in long runner games. After four or five expansions with the new Infinity Plus 8 sword that gives you 10 free mana, there is little point to using the Infinity Plus 3 sword that costs 2 mana, and let's not talk about the lame Infinity Plus 1 sword that costs 5 mana. Who'd, use, <laughs> who'd ever use that anyway? Power creep virtually always leads to the broken base, with the most conservative players starting that the new unbalanced content is an insult to the original game. On the other hand, 
there will be players who like these new add-ons, saying that it is actually makes the game more fun to play, or enjoy a particular playstyle that was poor in the original game but is now more viable with power crept material. Additionally, power creep can be a boon to tournament play. Long drawn out games are harder to schedule since it is less easy to predict when someone will finish on time. So with power creep making games faster, tournaments become less time consuming and easier to plan. This is not an ideal concern the makers of Magic the Gathering are on record as having to reject card designs because they would bring the match to a halt for a 5 to 10 minutes. As a general rule though, power creep has a negative connotation. The reason is that with a few exceptions, it shows that the procedures were unable to come up with something creative and instead reuse their old material with bigger numbers. Power creep also tends to lead a game beyond its planned gameplay style with one of the two results. It will become a competitive of rocket tag gameplay and mindless speed or of padded sumo gameplay and predictable slow strategies. So power creep in a trading card game is a necessary evil. And that isn't because of the corporations making it or anything like that. It's us as individuals. We, we become engaged in a game and to make that game continue to be engaging, we have to up the stakes, we have to up the speed, we have to up the complexity, we have to up the level of strategy that we're playing. Because you can like something and you can have more of the same for a while, but eventually you will become bored of it unless they are introducing new things to challenge and test you. We like to be challenged. So power creep is a necessary evil, not because of corporations wanting to make things stronger so they can rotate everything out and bring in new stuff and you have to buy the new things. Though, yes, that will be a factor because, because by making things a little bit more powerful, then you you have that fear of missing out, so you have to go and buy it. So yes, it works that way. But for you to want to buy more of something that essentially you already have, then that new thing has to be a little bit better. And that is why when you're designing your own game, whether you want it or not, power creep will creep into your game. And a quick word just to say thank you for watching this video up to this point. Don't forget to hit the like button and if you haven't already, hit that subscribe button and I hope to see you at the end of this video. Thank you very much. Okay, so let's take a look at extra turn because I don't know what this one means. So in any game that proceeds turn by turn, there are usually going to be a way to subvert or modify whose turn occurs when, how and or why usually in the form of granting the player an extra action outright or finding ways to make a given opponent lose slash skip their turn, which if more than two players slash characters are involved is subtly different. Taking more turns than your opponent can be a very useful and in some cases obscenely powerful ability depending on what the player decides to use it for. The extra turns are likely to become game breakers if the developers are not careful with how it fits in with the rest of their system. On the flip side, if the developers are too aware of the potential for breaking the meta game, these have a good chance of being made into useful, uh, useless useful spells by restrictions on how and where they can be used. So they're talking about like setting up ban lists and limit lists. So you go, oh, this is a really good spell, but we can't use it because, you know, it's too good. Know that in any game where the success slash failure of a particular action is decided by lot, e.g. by wheel slash spinner, dice roll, accuracy slash evasion check, it's always possible that the action may fail and allow other players to gain another turn over them wasting a turn with a failed action 
is not, technically speaking, the same thing as losing the turn before you even get it. But it's good to make that comparison, actually. So if you're making a TCG that involves a dice roll and you have good stats and your opponent has good stats, but not quite as good, but your dice roll is dependent on actually defeating your opponent. If you're failing to get those dice rolls, then you are essentially losing a turn and giving your opponent an extra turn. Your opponent could have above average luck and be, therefore be getting extra turns on the stronger player. Now you could see that as balancing, but this can also cascade very rapidly. So a losing player could lose even faster and this would be very frustrating for the losing player, which is what you want to avoid when making a game. You want the games to feel close, even if they aren't, because if they, if both players are having an engaging battle where they both feel like they have a chance of winning right up to the end of the game, then it's an exciting game. I mean, yes, it is fun to just wipe your opponent out completely and, you know, that level of dominance is great. But if you did that every time you played a game, you would get bored yourself. You need that challenge as well. So even your opponent coming back a few times and almost defeating you is a thrilling moment to have. It makes you want to play the game again just to make sure it isn't a fluke. All right, we're going to go into game design tropes and we're going to pick turn-based combat. Right, so a form of tabletop slash video game combat where players and their units act in turns. Combat time is a split into chunks slash turns, during which individual units can act in a more or less fixed order. While a player contemplates their next action, time stands still for everyone in the battlefield. Turn-based combat is one of the most glaring, acceptable breaks from reality, the suspension of disbelief. While utterly unrealistic, its, mo its major appeal lies in the ability to abstract the chaotic mess that is real-life combat into a few concise gameplay rules. Furthermore, its implementation tends to go easier on video game hardware than real-time combat, and it also allows for more gameplay complexity since the players have all the time they need to review all actions and to choose the best course of action. It is funny that we adopt that so so seamlessly, you know, we go, okay, so it's my turn to attack you, then it's your turn to attack me, and we've, we're just happy with that kind of rule set. You know, we, we never stopped and questioned going, well, why am I waiting to attack, you know? I think in my, in my mind, I'm not sure how you think of this, but in my mind, I kind of think that you use your move and then you're tired and then it's your opponent's turn to take their swing. I think if combat was more like real life, it would be very quick. Some people think these fights go on for ages. When, you, when you're watching a movie and there's two people fist fighting and they're just swinging at each other, it was that's, that's not accurate, you know? A, a fight is over in pretty much seconds. You know, you're, you're not gonna go on for five, 10 minutes and having this epic brawl. You know, you're just gonna go in f flailing some fists and somebody's gonna go down. And <laughs> that's pretty much it. And it's not pretty. These turn-based combat systems that we have in card games glamorize and extract like the, the beautiful style of what combat can be. It's not the same. <laughs> So this bit's interesting, turn-based combat is often confused with another less popular but distinct video game combat system, the combatant cooldown system. The rule of thumb to tell them apart is that a turn-based combat, every unit gets to act at least once per turn, unless killed or otherwise disabled, and their speed mainly determines who goes first. In a combatant cooldown system, faster units can act more often than slower ones, so it can occur that a ladder only moved once in the time it took for a former to move, cool down and move again. I don't know if there's already an existing TCG out there that has implemented a combatant cooldown system where instead of working with more of like a global timer, you have individual timers on cards. Though I imagine 
when you're doing that without a computer to monitor it, it's going to get very confusing. Though I suppose individual dice to count the times going down or, or tokens, but it, it's extra clutter. It becomes a little bit fuzzy, but it still might be a fun game to play if someone can master it. If you know a trading card game that uses a combatant cooldown system, then let me know in the comment section below. Thank you very much. All right, manipulating the opponent's deck. Now, for, in my mind, this is a big no-no. So let's see what they say about this. In collectible card games and deck building games, the most important factors in whether you win or lose or what cards are in your deck and which ones you draw, being able to predict and manipulate what you'll draw is a key component to strategy in most of those games. Whether that be through things like planting cards that allow you to search for and retrieve other cards that you need, or by simply putting as many copies of a certain card as you can into your deck in hopes of increasing your odds of drawing. This one says opponent's deck, so are we, are we gonna get to this point? However, all strategies in the world can't save you if your opponent decides to make you shuffle your hand into your deck and draw all new cards. Right? Just don't add that to your game. Some games allow or even encourage the direct manipulation of an opponent's deck during gameplay. Uh, during play. Common forms that this takes include discarding cards from your hand or deck. Okay, that's fair enough. Forcing you to reshuffle your deck. Well, that you can easily not add. And then adding deck cloggers to your deck, which shut down draws and may have harmful effects beyond that. In card games where not having another card to draw at the start of your turn is a loss condition, the strategy of trying to make your opponent run out of cards before you do is known as milling, originating from the millstone card in Magic the Gathering and later being added as a proper gameplay term. Oh, I didn't know that. That's that's a nice little uh, bit of history there. I mean, I always thought milling, because milling is like rotating things anyway, so you're, you're milling something out, aren't you? Like a, like a windmill, it, it spins, so you mill. But yes, there are some players that like to go for that deck out strategy, so they want to have cards in there, in their deck that is deliberately to make you lose cards from your deck. It entirely depends on what TCG you are playing, but forcing your opponent to shuffle their deck can either be hugely detrimental or just not make much of a difference at all. All right, so let's take a look at mass card removal. So in collectible card games and card battle games, players can place cards from their hand onto the board to attack and destroy your opponent's card trading away card resource into order to eventually attack your opponent directly. These games are often unstable equilibriums, as the side with more cards can often trade away even more cards than their opponent, forcing the losing side to face down a seemingly insurmountable army of cards with diminishing resources. Knowing that these scenarios exist, many card games will often implement the ultimate comeback mechanic to ramp up the game's intensity, removing everything, or at least making a good go at it. Colloquially known as board wipe, which will be used from here on for simplicity. Acting as a reset button for the game state in card games, board wipes are card effects that damage or destroy all cards on one or both players' fields. If used strategically, they can single-handedly trade away large amounts of enemy cards, dramatically shifting the tide of the game. Depending on the way that the game is designed, e.g. the presence or lack of card health system, mass removal may take the form of mass damage or direct removal. So this, this is quite interesting, right? So in this one caught my eye because recently, I say recently, a couple of months ago, I did a talk TCG on four essential cards that you need for your TCG. I'll put a link right above me and I'll 
I'll probably have it linked at the end of the video as well. Uh, it turned out it was ended up doing quite well, that little video. And that video also mentioned a board wipe card. So if you want to go into more detail on mass card removal, there's, there's a little bit more mentioned in that video. But the gist of it is, yes, you should have board wipe cards. Why they are essential is because they are a catch-up mechanic in a form. So when your opponent is getting way too far ahead, you can play a board white card, but what you should be doing is making sure that the cost is equivalent to this wipe. You know, you shouldn't be able to just play a simple card and just wipe the field. It needs to hurt you as well. If you're removing everything your opponent has, you need to feel the pain as well. Otherwise, your opponent is going to build up with resentment. And that means you've got two players there. One is resentful because the other player is using a cheap card and wiping out the field and the other player isn't being rewarded, they're being rewarded for, but not for having skill unfortunately. So there's a bit of a, a false sense of pride there which means that down the road they will fall for similar traps and, and they will not learn and progress better as players. But if you do want to learn a little bit more on four essential cards that you might need for your TCG, then make sure to hit that link at the end of this video. Okay, let's take a look at random effect spells. What's that? So a random effect spell is just that. A spell or an item in a video game that pulls from the pool of random effects instead of doing the same thing every time. Often, but not always, granted as a late game spell or ability or difficult to come by. The random effect spells effect can run the gauntlet from really cool to really lame. How big the effect pool is can depend on the time or spell, though frequently at least one or two of them will be a duplicate of an already existing spell or ability, if not all of them. Frequently, at least one possible effect of the spell will completely amazing such as dealing massive damage to all enemies that's board wipe spells we've talked about that but another will be completely horrible such as cutting all your character's health in half oh god no what we're going to do now guys so so the example that they gave here is a, a so roll a six-sided die for a strategy uh schema all oh, right is that sch sch schematology strategy schematology oh dear that's terrible <laughs> on, on one. So strategy schematic has no effect. Otherwise, it has one of the following effects. So awesome. Right. So destroy all artifacts. Destroy all lands. Oh, my God. No, you can't have that. <laughs> That's terrible. So I just want to point out one of these effects. So the uh, destroy all lands that I mean, to do that as easily as that. That's scary. I mean, obviously, this is, uh, I'm not sure what version this is from. That level of cost to destroy all lands, obviously, it is some form of joke. And I don't know the exact history of strategy schematic. If if you do, put in the comment section below. That, that might just uh, enlighten me a little bit. Thank you. But what I want to point out is the fact that they're destroying all lands. Now, your opponent has been slowly building up their resource. Their resource can only be increased once per turn. If you can wipe out all lands... Oh, but it's all lands, so it's my lands and your lands if I'm using it. Okay, that's still frustrating though, because it heavily slows down the game. You... <laughs> it is still a once per turn gain. It could essentially really like cripple the game depending how quickly you can get lands back onto the field. So this this one does scare me. And what I would recommend is if you've got a resource in your TCG is make sure that your opponent can't attack that resource. And that's just because when you're building up that certain resource, it's nice to make sure that it is safe, it is protected. They can attack your cards, they can attack your your deck, they can attack your, your graveyard, they can attack your life points, they can attack your shield cards, they can attack your tokens that you have on the field, they can attack anything else. But if you've got resources that you can use to deploy new things, it's best not to attack that. You know, because that is how the game goes. We want to make sure the game still goes. 
And speaking of how the game goes, I too must also go. So thank you very much for watching this video. Don't forget to hit that uh, to hit that video link there before if you haven't seen it already. And I hope to see you next time. Goodbye.